Facebook certainly thinks that virtual reality has got legs. It's shelling out $2 billion for VR startup Oculus Rift, an outfit which has designed a headset for use with PCs and possibly consoles. Sony's thrown its virtual hat, or should that be headset, into the ring with this. Dubbed Project Morpheus, it's a VR peripheral for the PlayStation 4. Morpheus has these lights on the front of it, which the PlayStation camera uses to figure out where the helmet is pointing. It also has two high-res screens inside and a band which is adjustable for a comfortable fit. The headset itself is a little bit on the heavy side. I'm not sure I'd be keen on wearing it for too long. One of the things which has hampered VR in the past is lag, or images the player sees taking a bit of time to catch up with their actual movements. In order to avoid this, the headset plugs into this box here, which manages most of the number crunching and processing required to create a lag-free experience. This means the actual PS4 console is left to worry about the gaming side of the equation. I put this to the test in the next demo, which requires an unusual peripheral, a beanbag. Now, I'm quite lucky because this particular demo hasn't been seen by anybody outside of the development team yet. It's a street luge experience. Now, this isn't a passive experience. I am actually controlling my movement by tipping my head left or right. This is really, really strange because I'm lying down and I can see a visual representation of, of my body in front of me, I'm almost convinced that that is my real body. But there's a strange disconnect between what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling. If I move my hand, I almost expect that my on-screen hand should be moving as well. And that is a testament ooh, to how convincing oh, this experience is. This isn't really a game as such, but this is the development team at Sony playing with what they can do with virtual reality, seeing how far they can push this technology before it hits prime time. I think it has the potential uh, to really be transformative in the, kind, in the way that we think about game experiences. It's by no means a final product at this stage. There's an awful lot more work to be done, I think, both on the software development as well as on the hardware development side. Uh, but we think there's a, a real potential there to push gaming into a new realm. Oculus Rift may not have had a huge press conference, but the new kid on the block has plenty of games in the pipeline, notably VR third-person platformer Lucky's Tale and the inventive time-freezing corridor-based combat of Superhot. 21-year-old Palmer Lucky is the brains behind Oculus Rift, and he doesn't think all types of games are appropriate for virtual reality. The best games for any platform are almost always the games that were made for that platform, whether it's Wii or Kinect or a mobile game or a you know portable console. The best games are not ports from other systems. And the same thing goes for virtual reality as well. The best games are not PC or console games with a VR mode. They're games that were made with the strengths and weaknesses of virtual reality in mind from the ground up. It's not just VR headsets making waves at E3. This is Control VR, a prototype rig which can convert hand and arm movements into accurate on-screen movements. Developed for military technology, its inertial sensors are so accurate, individual finger wiggles can be processed seamlessly. So, technology which was a failure in the 20th century certainly looks like it could find a home in the 21st. Mark Chislak, and while we wait for Oculus, Sony and the like to get their high-powered headsets up and running, how about this? Something a lot cheaper, but just as cheerful. This is the Vrismo VR headset, and you will notice that you can see the two lenses through there, which means at the moment there's no display in front of it. That is because the display is your smartphone. If you stick on the front like that, and there we go. Now each game that you play on this is obviously a special app which renders the visuals into two separate images, one for each eye. And I have to say the experience isn't bad. The resolution of the screen on this phone is fine and well, the experience isn't far off some of the higher end VR headsets that I've tried. The advantage of this setup is that if you upgrade your smartphone, for example, to an even higher res screen, you do get better visuals in your VR headset for, well, no extra expense. Oh, there's a zombie. 
Now you, oh there you are. Now you might think that most of the environments that you can explore with VR would be computer generated worlds, but there's actually a lot of talk about these headsets being able to drop you into the real world too. A sporting event for example, or a tech conference if you can't afford the hotel bills. But before you can display the world in 360 degrees, you have to work out how to capture it first. And Richard Taylor has been to see a couple of companies who are doing just that. Imagine, if you will, it's been a long, hard day at work. Simply plug in, kick back and transport yourself to an idyll of your choosing. Perhaps you'll head to the tropics. Maybe you'll marvel at the views from America's west coast. And predictably, it's from here that the cinematic VR scene is taking root. With the first camera crew allowed inside the offices of Jaunt, a new Silicon Valley startup making virtual reality very real indeed. The team has painstakingly built a camera rig which allows them to faithfully recreate a filmed scene in full 360 degree video. The top of the bridge here is it's a different height, so we need to also correct for cameras being at slightly different angles. Using advanced software to stitch it all together, the clip can be fed to me in 3D through my headset, accompanied by simulated 3D sound. Though the pictures are a little fuzzy, I do feel incredibly immersed, temporarily able to suspend disbelief. This is all about creating a sense of presence, and I really do feel like I'm in this scene. And that's why it feels slightly strange that when I look down, I don't see my legs. That's very weird. What's the end game for this, do you think? Well, I think the end game is really this, uh, that people will spend part of their day sort of virtually teleported, if you will, play shifted, where, where they uh, you know, maybe take a class online. They think about their vacation, and they then say, oh, maybe I'll try that hotel. They, they put it on, and now suddenly they're poolside that hotel. Unlike some of the other scenes that I've just witnessed where I'm just passively observing, there's an actual storyline going on here. I can see an alien appearing here. There's someone over there as well. And I have to confess, I'm not sure entirely where to look. VR presents many technical headaches too, and not just simulation sickness for users moving too quickly. Observers of the new medium say producing content also poses unique challenges. Because you're recording in 360 degrees, you're not able to move the camera, you're not able to have a place to hide the crew. Uh, so you need to uh, develop new cinematic uh, techniques in order to uh, tell the story that you want to tell. Which is precisely what they're doing at another Silicon Valley VR pioneer, Condition One. This is the maiden flight of its custom-built octocopter. It's carrying a prototype 360-degree camera rig. Not only does it solve the problem of having a crew on set, it also opens the doors to new frontiers entirely. Really, you want to explore the worlds you're in. And so we think it's really important to be able to move the camera through space, whether that's on an octocopter or a land-based drone, and give that sense of presence and immersion. Well, right now it feels like I'm being transported in a virtual chariot through the halls of uh, E3. It's quite amazing that I can see people in 3D in front of me. And if I look hard enough, I can even see that Spencer Kelly. 